Takeovers are billed as the sexy side of financial markets, but in a lot of cases they're actually a complete waste of time. More about that later. What are takeovers and how can investors expect to profit from them and what are one or two of the key pitfalls to watch out for? Well, that's going to be today's video topic. Okay, so takeovers. Uh, how do they work? Now, you might think, well, one company buys another, um, but you need to be a little bit specific about what you think that means and who's making the key decisions. So let's start off with a very quick summary. We could have a company that I'll call A, uh, A PLC most likely, and a company that we'll call B PLC. And we've got one group of shareholders who own company A and another group of shareholders who own company B. Okay, now the mechanics of a takeover and then we'll look at one or two of the pitfalls and how investors can get involved, um, are as follows. The board of company A need to make an offer to the shareholders of company B in order to get control of it. Because don't forget, the people who control companies are ultimately shareholders, insofar as key decisions have to go through them. So it is the shareholders of company B that need to be persuaded by the directors of company A that this is a good deal. So the directors of company A might wake up one day and think, well, buy company B. Now, we'll have a look at why they might think that in just a moment. And uh, what they need to do is persuade enough of the people who own company B to give up their shares. Okay. Now, what they might offer is cash. It doesn't have to be cash. It could be all kinds of other things. All right. Um, but normally, cash will be a chunky part of the deal. All right. And the shareholders need to effectively say yes by giving up their shares. All right, so this could be a cash for shares transfer. And the question as to how many of these people need to agree, well, 50% plus one vote is just about enough. All right, why? Because the board of company A can buy 50% plus one more vote all right, which means that some of these people might actually disagree, they might reject the offer, okay, then basically company A has control of company B through a majority of its voting shares. If you think about it, at the next annual general meeting of company B's shareholders, which now include the directors of company A, uh, company A's directors can say, let's get rid of all of the directors in company B. All right, and the minority left here might object. And company A's board say, let's take it to a vote. We have 50% plus one vote. That means all the directors of company B get fired, not 50% plus one. That's what control means, okay? So in a takeover, you might aim to get more than 50% plus one vote, but 50% plus one would, in theory, do it. All right, and we'll look at one or two more key percentages in just a moment. So there we have it. A takeover would result in the board of company A controlling, let's say, company B through a majority of its voting shares and then in theory they can do to company B as they will. All right. Now, does it have to be aggressive? I've almost described this as though there's something sort of skull, uh, skull and crossbones going on here, almost sort of Wall Street style, uh, Gordon Gecko. No, um, takeovers don't have to be aggressive or unfriendly or hostile and that's where there's a fight on for company A to actually get enough shares to control company B. All right. It could be friendly. It could be that company B shareholders go, yep, I'm liking the cash that's on the table and I'll disappear and retire early and spend it. All right. But in a hostile takeover, um, it can take quite a long time uh, for company A's board to persuade enough of the shareholders in company B that it's a good idea. And of course, the directors in company B may not recommend company A's deal to their own shareholders. They may try and fight it off. And in a moment, we'll look at how they can fight it off or one or two ways. All right. So. What else we've got to think about? Uh, well, let's have a look at just two more key percentages. Right, this is not a video about rules and regulations, but in the newspapers you will see a couple of key percentages other than the one I just mentioned, mentioned quite a lot. So imagine this is the percentage of company B that you could possibly own starting from zero. All right, if you own no shares in company B, and going up to 100% if you owned all of the voting shares in company B. All right, um, I just mentioned that 50% is quite a key percentage. Ideally, you want to get somewhere above that line 
in order to have control of company B. In other words, people sometimes think you have to get all the shares in company B, not strictly true, all right? Below that, 30% is quite important, and above it, 90% is quite important. I'll just mention those two, all right? Why are they important? Basically, a company may, may try and take over another one by stealth, bit by bit, chunk by chunk. All right, it may build a stake in a target company. That's the one being bought. Okay, predators, the ones doing the buying, targets, the ones being bought. That's the language of the city. So you may get up to just below 30%, and the reason you'd stop is because at that point, you can be forced by the panel on takeovers and mergers to try and make a pitch for the rest of the company. They reckon you are annoying enough at, say, 30%, to cause problems at annual general meetings company B, so you can be forced to make a bid, which is why you'll see journalists talk about stakes of 29.99%. Quite often that's because somebody has got close to the limit and stopped. And the reason they've stopped, they don't want their hand forced before they're good and ready. All right? 90%. If you manage to snaffle up at least 90% of the shares in company B, you can kick out the minority who are not playing ball. You can just say, look, I'm sorry, you guys are going to just take what's on the table and go. All right. So, just a couple of key other percentages there. There are others, but I won't mention them in this video. Now then, um, what next? How can Company B defend themselves against the predator attempting to take them over? Well, again, there are many varied takeover defences. I'll just mention two or three in this video. Okay. One, and they all have quite sexy sounding names, is the White Knight. Company B doesn't want to be taken over by Company A, so it finds someone else that it prefers. Okay and they buy Company B instead. Now, they're going to have to outbid Company A, obviously, come up with something which is better for Company B shareholders, but a white knight is that kind of defence. There are others. You can depth charge your own company. So Company B might use what's called a poison pill, and that could be a clause, for example, that allows existing shareholders to buy shares in Company B at a discount, all right? Kind of squeezing out the aggressor. All right, it's called a poison pill. There's the Pac-Man defence, all right? Pac-Man, gobble, 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 takes the magic pill, turns around, gobble, 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 all right? That's the one where the target becomes the predator. All right, unbeknown to the predator, the target has a couple of tricks up its sleeve, like a big cash war chest, for example, and access to funding, all right, perhaps plus combined with the white knight, and it actually, much to the uh, shock of company A, turns, if you like, into the um, predator. That's called a Pac-Man or reverse takeover defense. And there are various other ones. There are the management team of company B might get together and decide they're gonna buy out the company. Okay, so there are various ways the company B could potentially defend itself against a takeover bid from company A. Now, where does all this get us as an investor? Well, here's the thing. Here's an interesting thing that's been observed about takeovers, and here's where an investor can think about making a quick buck, perhaps using something like spread bet. All right, what tends to happen when one company takes over another, or sort of in anticipation of one company taking over another, is you tend to get the predator's share price falling and the target share price tends to rise. Now, why is that? And the answer is very simple. Countless studies have shown that companies tend to overpay when they do takeover deals. Many, many takeover deals create a lot of fire and brimstone at the time, but long-term add very little value to anybody, in fact. So we'll ask the question why they've done at all in a, in a moment. Right, but but um, this is an observable fact about takeovers. So people reckon the predator will get carried away with itself, get excited, right, like a kid in a sweet shop, and overpay. They'll be, in some way, they will end up overpaying for company B. And long term, that's not good for the predator. So quite often, all right, you'll see a dip in the predator's share price. Meanwhile, people are thinking, crikey, all right, you know, the, the target would be lucky to ever achieve the kind of share price that's that's you know, on the table, if you like, as part of what the predator's prepared to pay. In other words, the price of you know, um, 15 pounds per share is way above where the target share price is ever gonna get under its own steam, all right? So, um, what tends to happen is you, you quite often see, around the time of takeover, target share price rising, predator share price falling. And for people who like to play around with spread bets, for example, that would give you the opportunity, if you saw this coming, to buy the target and sell the predator. All right, the reason I say you might want to use spread bets is because um, shorting actual shares for a UK retail investor is a little bit tricky, so you might need to find some other way of doing it. All right, spread bets aren't for everyone, but that's one possible way you can do what's called M&A arbitrage, which if nothing else sounds exciting when you're down the pub with your mates. Okay, 
Now, now, I suppose two final questions in this little short, sharp video. Um, number one, just a reminder, why is it that many, many, many takeovers do not add long-term value? All right, well, I've, I've hinted at that. It's that there is a tendency for companies to overpay, get carried away with themselves. It's the adrenaline, testosterone of the city is often competition, okay, to buy companies. Okay, look at some of the deals that went on just before we had the last crash or just before the dot-com crash. Okay, make that case rather nicely. Um, so, you know, the, the timing of these kind of feeding frenzies, M&A going on in the city, can often be, by no, no, not surprisingly, at the point where shares are getting pretty toppy anyway, getting quite expensive. All right, so that leads on to the question, why are there so many takeovers? If, if there are these studies from the likes of McKinsey and KPMG saying, well, long term, quite a few takeovers don't really add any value to anybody, okay, um, certainly not the um, predators, shareholders, why do so many takeovers take place? Because they're in the press all the time. All right, and I'd offer you three or four reasons. Number one, it's quick. It's far faster to buy someone else's company often than to grow your own. All right, that has the added benefit of taking out a rival, one of the reasons why it's quicker, okay? It plays to directors' need for excitement and adrenaline. Most big directors want to be running big FTSE 100 companies fast, you know, within five years. How do you do that? Buy lots of your competitors, okay? It's much more exciting, after all, to do M&A, all right, than it is sometimes to do the nitty-gritty of running an actual business. And finally, it generates huge amounts of fees for the investment banks, who will often take out a cut, okay, of, say, the amount of money raised in order to do the takeover deal. All right? And so there is pressure, if I can call it that, from excitable investment bankers looking to earn a fee. All right? And one of the ways they can do that is to get uh, mergers and acquisitions activity going. Okay? So there's three or four reasons why takeovers and mergers are pretty common, in spite of the fact that long term um, yeah, there may not be a lot of value added. Okay, I could throw in just a final point, which is the city has a short memory. All right, and all those studies showing that last time around things didn't work out too well long term um, for the predator shells in takeovers, those tend to get forgotten and swept to one side the next time um, a boom takes hold. And one final point I forgot to mention is can a takeover be blocked even if the predators directors want to go through with it? And the answer is yes. There is an organisation called the Competition Commission. Ironically, there's only one of those. All right, it's a government body and they can step in and say this takeover is not happening and it can take them six months to reach this kind of conclusion because it's anti-competitive. It gives uh, the combined company too much power. Okay? So for example, it's highly unlikely, never say never, that Tesco would be allowed to buy another UK food retailer because that would give it too much clout in the UK food retail market. So they're busy expanding overseas. All right? um, are these rules hard and fast? Uh, no. Um, for example, in the UK audit market, a firm called PricewaterhouseCoopers have a huge share of the market, but the Competition Commission doesn't seem to be that bothered about that. So people have said they get worried when one firm might be about to control 25% or more of a given market, but that's definitely not a black and white hard and fast rule. Okay, so if a takeover seems to be taking a long time to go through or is getting delayed or even fails, it might be because the competition authorities have stepped in and said, not on our watch.